All right, I just want to say welcome to the first of our webinar series, Money Talks. My name is Sharifa Muniz, and I am the founder and executive director of the New Way Foundation, an organization with a mission to inspire the next generation of dreamers to rise to their highest potential. I have to say that we are so humbled uh, to be able to let you know that over a thousand of you signed up for today's event. We are so grateful. And as a token of that appreciation, we are entering everyone attending today's event for a chance to win a copy of Get Good With Money, written by no other than one of our panelists, Tiffany the Budgetista Alice. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. For those of you just joining us, welcome. This event would not have been possible without the partnership of Volunteer Match. So I'd like to introduce you to the Chief Solutions Officer of Volunteer Match, my friend and co-producer of today's event, Laura Plato. Thank you so much, Sherry. And hello, everyone, and welcome again. I am Laura Plato. I'm Solutions Officer at Volunteer Match, and we are the largest nonprofit network on the web, connecting volunteers with opportunities to give back locally and virtually in your hometown, across the United States, and around the world. And it is such an honor to be with you all today and begin to introduce this incredible group of leaders. It's my job and my pleasure to introduce our panel moderator, Zynga Blake. Zynga is an Emmy Award winning executive producer working at the intersection of entertainment, social impact, and cause marketing. She's known for her work as a storyteller who uplifts and multicultural and underrepresented voices in ways that change the social and cultural conversation. And her career spans work in front of and behind the camera as a writer, a host, a director, a producer with numerous organizations, including Tribune Media, BET, The CW, Cartoon Network, and Showtime. And she's currently executive producer race and culture at ABC Own TV Studios. So Zynga, I wanna thank you for joining us here today. I'm gonna to turn it to you to introduce our panelists and get us going and kick us off. Thank you so much, Laura and Sharifa. I am so humbled and honored to be here today to moderate this very much needed conversation. So I'm gonna get right down to introducing our awesome panelists. First up, please welcome Tiffany, the budget nista Aliche. Tiffany, the budget Nista Liche is America's favorite personal financial educator. Through her Live Virtue movement, she's helped over 1 million women save, manage, and pay off millions of dollars. A former teacher for 10 years with a master's degree in education, Tiffany was instrumental in getting the budget Nista law passed in 2019, making financial education mandatory for middle school students in New Jersey. Please welcome Tiffany the budget Nista Alice. Thank you for being with us. With, be, thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for having me. Yay! You're <laughs> a star. <laughs> we got another awesome trailblazer, Terry Igioma. Terry Igioma began her professional career working in education and nonprofits. When she started trading stocks nine years ago, she initially saw it as an opportunity to supplement her income. However, she was so successful with this side hustle that in 2017, she decided to quit her job, travel the world, and became and begin trading full time. While traveling, Terry was constantly asked to show others how she was successfully trading in the stock market. She set up and taught her first class in Thailand, her second in Vietnam, and had, had a fully fledged curriculum created by the time she returned to the United States. Terry now offers an online curriculum that shares her investing strategies with people from all over the world. She also partners with organizations and companies to train and empower individuals to achieve financial freedom and build wealth through investing. Welcome, 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 Terry. Thank you for having me. This of is course. great. Yes, it 
is. And we've got Laureen Pendleton. Laureen Pendleton is a seasoned investor, business development executive, and attorney with extensive experience in the legal technology and entertainment industries. She was a guest judge on BET and Centric TV's breakout series, Queen Boss. Yes, honey, she's a queen boss. Among other accolades, she was named by Crunchbase as 39 Black women investors, inspiring a new generation of investors. And Black Enterprise as one of the 20 angel investors you should know. Lorraine is an angel investor who has invested in 20 plus early stage companies with founders of color, women, LGBTQ, or companies with products or services addressing these markets. While an attorney at a leading entertainment boutique law firm, she structured and negotiated deals on behalf of clients such as Prince, Spike Lee, Rough Rider Records, Faith Evans, Stevie Wonder, Shaka Khan, and the estate of the notorious B.I.G. Well, if you don't know these ladies, now you know them, ladies and gentlemen. Again, welcome every, th th thank you, thank you, thank you. This is black excellence on full display right here. You all are game changers change agents, trailblazers, power players, you name it. The fact that we get to share this space and learn from you today is truly an honor, especially during Black History Month, which I will note, I am replacing the M with magic because it's Black History always, and this is Black History magic happening right here. So again, thank you for being here. Um, you know, it's been a really, really hard time for so many of us. So to all of you in the audience, we're going to go ahead and allow you all to type your questions in the Q&A box and our team will feel them as, as we, you know, as much as we can. So ladies, let's get down to it. I think it's safe to say that 2020 was a rough year for so many communities, especially communities of color and also women, you know, with the impact of COVID in our lives. So there's a lot going on. And this conversation is timely. And the hope today is to give hope and empower, right? And guide people on their journey through financial stability, freedom, and some are even calling it financial wellness, which is a great place to start. So can each one of you share with us through a personal story, what is financial literacy or financial wellness, however you like to define it? What does it mean to you and why is it important? Tiffany, why don't we start with you? So, for me, I actually refer to it as financial wholeness, right? Because I, to me, financial wholeness is when all aspects or just about 10 specific aspects of your financial life are working together for your, your greatest good, your biggest benefit and your richest life. Because I, when I was teaching preschool, before I became the budget niece, I was a preschool teacher for 10 years. And I actually was pretty close to 100% financial wholeness, despite not making a ton of money. And then I lost everything due to the recession. Um, and as I was rebuilding, I also came back with this fear. And although I had made my business, the budget needs successful and I had money set aside and I had reached what traditionally would be called financial freedom, I was more freaked out than ever before <laughs> because I was so afraid to lose it all. And it was because I had focused on one aspect of my financial life and ignored the rest. I was like, you got a pile of money. And I realized like, okay, but what happens if you get sick, Tiffany? How's your health insurance looking? Oh, not so good. You know, like, well, what about your estate? What happens if you're not here? You know, what, what do you have beneficiaries in all of your accounts? And that's when I started to realize that, that your financial life is more important than, it's not just this one aspect of somehow trying to work toward growing like this large pile of money that I want you to look at it holistically. I want you to think about, yes, your budget and credit and debt, but also investing and also in savings and getting financial assistance if you need it, like through professionals and having an estate plan and your insurance plan. And so, yeah, that to me, financial wholeness is when all of those aspects of your financial life are working together for your greatest good, because Money is not the goal. It's just one of the tools that you can use to make a better life for yourself. That's incredible. And ladies would like to. I'll, I'll piggyback off that because um, I have actually a story about how money changed healthcare for me in, in light with what Tiffany said about just wholeness and about how it can also change like your health. So my dad, well, my stepdad actually went to go get an MRI and he went to get the MRI and they told him, well, you can't have this done unless you pay the whole thing up front. And it was a shock to him because he was like, no, my insurance should pay for it. 
And they were like, no, you know, the way things are going right now, you have to have this set up up front. And so he went and he didn't have the money in his account. So he actually had to leave the, the doctor and go away. And this was an MRI that's really important. Like we needed to know what was going to happen, but he couldn't afford it. And honestly, this was recent. So I felt in my soul, I was like, how in the world could I let my parent, I'm this millionaire, you know, supposed to be this million, multi-millionaire girl, and my parent couldn't pay for his, his doctor appointment. So I said, never again am I going to ever let that happen. So I put some money into an account and I told all my parents, if you guys ever need anything done, then you have this money here to take care of the, the procedure you need. So fast forward a few weeks later, my mom calls me and she's ecstatic. And she's just like, oh my God, I can't believe that, you know, this just happened. I'm like, what mommy, what? And she said, I went to the dentist. And the dentist said that I needed to get four teeth worked on. And each one of them was $2,500. And I was able to tell them, okay. <laughs> and she was so excited, but she could actually afford the work that she needed on her teeth. And for me, that's what money, that's what financial wellness is. It's being able to afford the things that you really need and afford the things that you want. Like there are so many people that are going to get procedures and are need to get work done. Even with this COVID thing, I think it's affecting black and brown communities because we can't afford to not go to work. We can't afford to go get the medicines we need. So that's what having financial wholeness means, being able to afford those things so that we can, as a community, be better all together. Lorraine? Mm -hmm. Just back on what everyone said, for me, it's really, um, you know, kind of financial, you know, literacy and all of this builds uh, independence. And so, you know, you need to, you know, be able to make money and you can make it in all kinds of ways by investing. Well, Lorraine, hold on. Um, can people, can everybody hear? Lorraine? No. No. Okay. Hold on, stand by. It's pretty low. Okay. Um, why don't you go to someone else and then I'll try to figure out what's going on. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll, get, we'll definitely have to come back to you. So, you know, oh, that was better? Okay, why don't we try you now? Okay, can you hear me better? Perfect. Okay. okay. <laughs> nice. All right. yes. Okay, I adjust my Zoom settings, made it as high as possible. Anyway, um, what I was saying is, um, I think with financial, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, being able to learn and, and know how to make money is really important. But then also, when you make money, um, and you can make it various ways. I mean, it doesn't have to be a traditional way you get a corporate job, you know, these ladies on stage are evidence of that. Um, but you know, um, you can do it other ways, you could, you can, you know, buy stocks and sell stocks. Um, but then once you get that money, it's also protecting and retaining your wealth, which is really important. And that may mean, you know, getting health insurance, getting life insurance. If something happens to you, you have money to leave behind for your family. And so all of the, all those things are really important. So it's looking at your wealth and financial picture, like the complete whole picture and not just, you know, um, one part of it. You mentioned when I was practicing as a lawyer, you know, we represent the state of uh, Notorious B.I.G., Biggie. He actually died without a will. And um, so part of what we had to do is like navigate that. And there were certain things because of that, because he died without a will. And, you know, um, because he died without a will, all of his assets go to his wife. And at the time he was married to Faith Evans, but they had been separated, but she technically was still his wife. And so that's probably not what he wanted to do, have all the money go to her and not go to his mother. And so we had to, you know, work through that. But that's just a prime example of someone who had assets and had money um, and, and didn't have a proper will. And um, so many valid points um, with all of you ladies in terms of like savings, right? Now, so many people are just living day to day. So when should we ideally start saving and investing? Like we've got student loans, um, you know, there's a lot of debt. So where do we begin? So here's the thing. I don't, I know people are like, I'm the budget nista, but I don't believe that debt freedom should be the goal. It is a goal. 
So, but there's a study that was done. I think it was done. I can't remember who did it, but that showed that the average, you know, um, um, financial um, goal for the African American community was was to become debt free, and then the average goal for the larger community at large, you know, everyone else was to grow wealth. Because what happens is it's stunting. Like I, I share that I have a nephew. He doesn't have a car note. He doesn't have a student loan debt. He doesn't have a mortgage. He doesn't owe anyone, and he's five. Roman is broke, right? Because if the debt freedom meant wealth, then Roman would not be eating up all my, my graham crackers when he comes over. Every toddler you know would be out here bling blinging. These kids are broke. Debt freedom does not equal wealth, you know? And I want our community to lean into um, understanding that even savings, that savings really is a vehicle so you can start to invest. It's almost like we budget, oh, got it. Okay, we save, whew, okay. We pay off their debt, Woo, okay, we're done. No, no, that that is just the foundation for your ability to then grow your the rest of your financial house on that foundation. And it is, you cannot save your way to wealth, not true wealth. And it's through wealth that you can really start to transform your life. Like I always say, so imagine that you live on two different islands. There's regular island where you live now, and then there's wealth island. And you're wanting to go from regular island to wealth island. Well the bridge that bridges that bridges the two is investing. Like you're not going to get from regular island to wealth island without to invest because it's just not, you know, like whether investing in starting a business, whether investing in the market, whether investing in real estate, investing. And the car, what fuels the car over wealth island or, or what fuels the car over the investing bridge to connect the two is savings, right? Because that's how it starts. So at some point, we have to learn how to live below our means to create that excess. Yes, to use savings initially as to, to create some like emergency buffer, but then anything above, above that to put that money to work so we can start to build sustainable wealth. Because here's what happens. Like it's not just the problem with what's happening to the, to the black community is that you can grow wealth. And if you don't use it, to enhance the community, it's not enough. Like, so I have been a self-made millionaire for like the last five years, right? And I was gonna like the house I live in now, my husband and I, we bought it cash, we renovated it cash. And I said, you know, maybe we should do a, a cash out refi. We'll pull money out and, and put it into the market. We had an appraisal come, an appraiser come to the house. And I always said, if I ever had an appraiser come to this house that I was gonna ask my friend, Catherine, she's white to be Tiffany because already knew. And if you're black, you know exactly why like, yep, right? But it was literally the beginning of COVID. I couldn't ask Catherine to do so. They came, they appraised the house, seemed low. But you know, as, also as a black person, I was just like, am I, is it low? Because you're also like, am I hypersensitive? But I was like, I don't know, seems a little low. Asked my friend who was a realtor, could she take a look? Asked another realtor, could she take a look? They were like, yeah, seems low. Then as luck would have it, I think I, I must have mentioned it on social media, Somebody from the New York Times reached out to me, asked to do an interview on me and, and, and um, how black wealth is eroded from these, this appraisal process. I said, sure. I just went through something like myself, that myself. And she said, can I see your appraisal? And I'll have it independently looked at. I was like, yes. And she did. And it was low. Not low by accident, but low by the houses that he compared it to. My house is brand new. Like it, when we moved in, I had renovated like every single doorknob is new. We'd renovated it, had not lived here for five months. He wrote down, this is a wear and tear house. He like, that's what he, that, that's not an accident to put us as a C2 instead of a C3, right? He also, the other comparables that he put were not comparable to this home. Um, they lowered our square footage. It was, these are intentional things. And um, so I share that growing your, like it's important for us to grow wealth because then you can have a say at the table. You can you can connect with, so I'm working with my lawmaker. So I got the budget needs to law passed. We're working on the budget needs to appraise the law. The bill is actually already out there to make it illegal to come to a black, brown or whatever person's house and to, and to under appraise that house. Cause it's not just my appraisal. It's wealth is in this country is passed through um, real um, real estate more than almost anything else. And so, if you say my house is worth thirty to fifty thousand dollars less, and then my stepdaughter inherits it, she's already been cut off. You know, like so I, I don't think non-black and brown people understand 
when we say it's made harder, like when, when Lorene says it's harder for us, I think people kind of like, oh boy, if you just work hard. I'm sorry, how, how do I outwork someone coming to my house and saying it's work, worth less? I, I can't. I mean, I, like I said, I'm wealthy now. And yet I don't have a choice. I, I'm sure, I, I don't know how much money that man made, but that had no, no bearing on what I was able to tell him to do. But I am able to use my relationships and you know, to, to affect change. But I, I just think that like, yes, us working toward growing wealth, leaning into the relationships that we have, you have the ability to make change with your money, but also with your relationships. And I just encourage that. I just want to jump on what you said just really quickly to add on. So there's different, I told people there's three, three C's, three capitals, three types of capital. So there's financial capital, so money you have in the bank, but there's also social capital. And Tiffany is mentioning her social capital that she's able to reach out to people when she had this situation with her appraisal. She has a network of people she can, you know, have her help her out. Um, to get to the bottom of what's going on. She had the New York Times contact her. That's if she wasn't who she was, they wouldn't contact her. That's social capital. So uh, be aware of the different capital and the wealth that you may have. You may not have a lot of money in your bank account, but maybe you have other things that can you know, generate wealth or other things that you can use to your advantage. And then human capital, you may have an expertise that's in demand that other people may wanna you know, have access to. And so you know, kind of bartering that, like, so if you're a financial person, accountant, you know, someone has a business, they don't have their financial statement in order, why not you know, look at that and help them out? So you know, it's not always what you have in your bank. You know, we, have, we have different types of capital. So that's also a type of wealth as well. Yeah, and I would just say too to your question that it's a myth that you have to have that you have to start with a lot of money to start investing. Like that's one of the biggest myths that I think we perpetuate through our community. Like in one of the brokers that I work with, you can start with $500 and then trade in a simulated account while you're learning. And that's actually what I encourage people. Even if you're starting to invest, start small, but then while you're learning, practice in a, in a simulator account with fake money. Then as you become a better and better trader, then you can start putting more money into the account and putting your money to work. But you don't have to start with a ton, just start and then get educated well maybe that's a good place for us to go to because don't you feel like especially with black and brown communities let's be honest what are some myths right now that we can yeah. dispel when it comes to investing who can wants I, to do that can i start on that one Absolutely. so there's four that come up all the time first one we'd covered already you have to start with a lot of money that's not true you can start with 500 dollars and then get started in investing Next one is, oh, Terry, it's going to take so much time. I don't have the time to invest. Well, now I, there are different ways to invest. There's long-term investing. There's active investing the way that I do. But many times, once you've learned how to read a chart, it's really just being able to look at your phone a couple of times, check to see how your stocks are doing. You may have to do some homework. I'm not saying you don't have to do any homework, but maybe at nighttime you do some homework. But it's not that you're just sitting in front of a computer screen all day. And, and watching the computer. I think that's a myth. So really the time it takes will depend on what type of investor you are. And as you become a better investor, it actually takes less and less time. So that's a myth. Then we have the myth of, myth of Terry, it's a gamble. And this is more perspective for active investors, like I'm a day and swing trader, but there are ways to actually calculate your trades ahead of time. So when I'm looking at a chart, I can calculate what my potential risk is on a trade and what my potential reward is. We make sure not to take trades unless they're three times the reward to your risk. And when you can actually calculate that ahead of time, then you can take some of that gamble out. This is now a calculated risk that you're taking. Right. So there are ways to put in formulas and put in safety nets, even something called a stop loss that that protects you if the stock is going down. You can actually say, OK, if this stock goes down uh, to fifty dollars, take me out the trade. That's called a stop loss. But see, I didn't know that until I got educated. I didn't know you could do things like that. But those are ways to protect yourself. So it's not such a gamble. So that's another one. And then. Well, that's three, and then I can kick it to everybody, but it's it's not gonna take you a ton of time. You can do it. It doesn't take a ton of money. You can start small. And then in terms of the gamble, we can teach you how to have risk management, but that's why you have to get educated about it. Mm -hmm. Tiffany, you're I, on. Okay. I would just throw in one, uh, another one to add to that is that you have to be debt-free, 
right? I think people think like I've actually seen um, other financial educators say that you have to be completely debt free before you start doing any sort of investing. And the problem is that you miss out on the power of compounding interest. You know, like you just you can't get back. You you can't get pat, past the loss if you don't start now. The sooner the better. So I, I share compounding interest like so I used to be a preschool teacher. I'm like really visual, right? So let's just say this is your principal. You're like, oh, okay. $5, $50, whatever. Then you're like, okay, compounding interest is, okay, your money just made money. When your money makes money, that's interest. And at first it doesn't seem like much, but what happens is when you're, when you make money on the money and the interest, this fold is folding, not just the paper, but the previous fold. That's interest on interest. All of a sudden, how much more quickly did it get thicker? And then all of a sudden one more fold now, your money's making money on the money, meaning that your interest is earning interest on the interest. And all of a sudden that thin little paper, just that quickly, is just that much thicker. And before you know it, you keep doing that. And it's like, when you're earning interest on the interest on the interest, that's compounding interest. But if you don't start, then you stay here with this flat piece of paper forever and ever. Or yes, if you delay, the sooner you can start, the sooner you can get taken from this to that thicker piece of paper. And I think that um, waiting until you're 100% debt free now, here's the thing, you don't want to have um, what I call expensive debt. So like credit card debt, if you've got a credit card, you know, double digit interest, 20%, you know, you're know, you wanting to really pay down that expensive debt first, but I'm not gonna wait to invest to get rid of my student loan debt. That's usually interest that's under under ten percent. I'm not going to wait to invest to be to pay off my mortgage because you'll be at it for you can start thirty years from now. No, like it, you know, like Terry said, you you have the opportunity now to get started, and you have the opportunity to take advantage of compounding interest. And Tiffany, I actually paid off my student loans with trading. Girl, I paid off my, my business. <laughs> like, literally, I was the foreclosure queen. I said, "Up oh, now, right now." Because you yeah. know what happened, Terry, is that like I took two and a half years out of my life. I'd lost my job in 2008, 2009, moved back home with my parents because I couldn't afford anything, then moved in with my sister, I was working all these little small jobs. I had this credit card debt that was eating away at me, $35,000. So I used unemployment, all these little jobs, two and a half years of living so small to pay off that credit card debt. I paid it off and I was like, I'm still broke. Right. And I just remember thinking, I'm glad I paid it off because the credit card debt had high interest. But I was just like, so wait, I also have the student loan debt. Am I going to have to live like this for the next four years? I didn't want it. So I was like, you know what? Instead of focusing on getting debt free, let me focus on investing. And for me, investing was into my business. So I said, I'm going to take that same three or four years to grow my business. And so at the end, I was able to pay that $52,000 off one check buy this house, it was a foreclosure for $180,000, renovate it for $180,000, pay off my parents' house for $120,000, still have so much money left in my bank account. But do you see that same four years past, I could have been just debt-free or I could have grown wealth that led to additional debt freedom. Exactly. Lorraine, do you have any to add to that about like some just dispelling myths before we move on? I mean, not, not too much. I mean, I think, I mean, what I would say is whatever you can save and, and invest in, even if it's a small amount, you know, try to do it sooner rather than later. And so it means like, you know, you skip buying, you know, coffee at Starbucks, you save that, you do that a couple of times a week, that stuff adds up. And so saving, and as Tiffany mentioned, compounding interest. And then the other thing is some, some of the brokerage firms allow you to buy fractional shares of stock. So you don't necessarily have to buy a whole stock. So like, say you want to buy a stock that's like $300 trading at 300, you know, you could, there's, there are companies that have created services where you can buy fractional shares. And then over time you'll own that stock. So, I mean, I just say like, just don't wait, just start, you know, start investing, start saving, um, you know, as soon as you can, and maybe, you know, don't do something else that allows you to free up that money to, to invest it. Well, we have we have a high schooler actually here, and I'm I commend them for being on this panel. And they said, "I'm a high schooler. How can I start investing in my future now?" My gosh, if I was, I wish I had that mindset. And we're about to change your life, young high schooler. So, who wants to take this question? Well, let me just okay. Go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Start learning. Yeah, so it's interesting. Go. A company I just invested in called Goal Center, and it's basically a savings. It creates. Um, it has a product where. My friend, you know, yeah. Yes, 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I invested in her, my fund, we invested in her great, great company because basically former Nickelodeon executive, she makes it fun to kids to learn about financial literacy. And then instead of you giving them gifts for their birthday, you can have, you know, a savings account and also goal setters. So parents, when they do chores, they can get money and it teaches kids the value of money. And so you should look at that. And also one of the things that she said when we were looking at the company, she said kids that, you know, end up saving money are actually six terms more likely to end up going to college. And then ones who actually save, like when they're kids are five times more likely to start investing in the stock market. So uh, kudos to you, whoever's on, um, you know, um, person who's a student who's not an adult yet, you know, look at companies like that Goal Center, which is African American uh, led company. It's an amazing company, um, you know, and so I would say, you know, save now. It really will impact your future. That's fantastic. Uh, ladies, would you like to add? Um, I'll jump in there. So I actually learned about stocks in high school. So my, my junior year going into senior year, I did a program called LEAD where we all went to business schools. Like they got minority students from around the country and took us to business schools. And I went to Northwestern University and they took us to the Chicago Stock Exchange. So that was my first intro into stocks. And then my senior year, Google had their IPO and they IPO'd at $83 a share. And I remember going to all my teachers, none of them knew how to get involved. I went to my grandmother, she didn't know how to get involved. So this is what I would say for the, the, the high schooler. First thing first, you have to open a brokerage account. You can't invest in stocks unless you have the right account. And the worst thing is when you see an opportunity like I did with Google, but you don't have the right account set up. So open a brokerage account. Um, I use one called TradeStation, but there's so many out there. E-Trade, TD Ameritrade. Um, find one that's more robust because I feel like if you're in high school now, you're going to want one that can grow with you. So you want one that is more powerful, like the I interactive brokers, Charles, something more powerful. So first step, open a brokerage account. Two, get educated. And I know I keep throwing that out there, but I've been trading now for 11 years. The first six years, I was teaching myself on my own and just losing money, trying to like watch CNBC and create my own algorithms. So I do think while you're in high school now, go ahead and sign up for courses. Of course, I'm going to plug mine, trade and travel, but you can, you can do any courses. Just learn the basics so that by the time you turn 18, when you can really have your account, you already know what to do. You can pay. I, I When I was in college, so I went to MIT, one of the students, a white guy, I used to watch him all the time. He actually paid for his tuition in college by trading stocks. And he was the one that put in my head that like, you can actually use stocks now to pay for things. So you may be able to pay for your whole college tuition by trading if you get started now, but start learning, practice in that simulator with that paper account, and then you'll be really great by the time you're a little older. And I just want to throw in that, remember that there are multiple ways to invest. So I've got a 14 year old stepdaughter and she did a business plan for her and her, my, my, her father and I to invest in her lip gloss business. She's like, for the small fee of $450, I was like, girl, you tried it. No, so that didn't work, but she started some other business and now she's starting her YouTube business. But that is a form of investing and I encourage, so I didn't invest in the other business, but I told her whatever money she raises for whatever business venture she's trying, that I will match her. You put up, you know, you save a hundred dollars from babysitting, things like that, then I will match you. But it is a form of investing as well. You know, um, so, you know, there's traditional investing where people think of like investing in the market. There's real estate, which you might be a little young for, but you're not too young to start a business. I mean, when I was, I'm sure everyone had a candy person in high school, right? Right. So like <laughs> you were the candy person, right? Like, I mean, it was lollipops. I didn't know my friend, Amy, she was making so much money because that girl was making enough money to pay bills at her own house in high school. And so, so you, there are ways for you to um, invest, start your business because you have an ear to the streets. Like I told Alyssa, for example, like I was like, you know, I'm hearing that there are a lot more people who are wanting to learn about personal finance on TikTok. I have a TikTok account. I don't know how to TikTok, but you know who does all day long? That 14 year old. I said, girl, how much are TikTok lessons? She was like, $20. <laughs> so we, we be TikTok lessoning, right? So I, I encourage you to also lean into your current skill set. You might have a business then. If you can start, start a business now, then you won't, you will be so much further ahead when you get to be our age. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking notes for my little eight-year-old now because I, I see she's business savvy too, so I need to support that. Um, I think here's a very important question um, from one of our audience members. How can we make enough to bring generational poverty to an end? How can we pass wealth along? Is it real estate, life insurance, stocks, a combination? Who wants to start? I can jump in. I mean, I think it's a combination of all those things, but also entrepreneurship. And I mean, that's that's the reason why, you know, I'm doing what I'm doing. I have a VC fund and investing in diverse founders. And because I really believe the way that will narrow the wealth disparity in this country for black and brown people is if we pr support our entrepreneurs of color who are out there and make sure that they have the capital they need to grow their business. Obviously not every business is gonna do well like anything. I mean, not every business is gonna be successful, but the fact that only 1% of African-Americans get any kind of VC funding in this country is to me abysmal. And so that's why, you know, I'm investing in these companies because, you know, I told you about Goal Setter. You know, she invested. Uh, she she raised four million recently, and I was one of the people that invested in. My fund was one of the people invested in her fund recently. She got great like athletes, pro athletes, who invested, and now they're promoting Goal Setter. They're drafting. Basically, they want to draft a million black and brown kids to set up forty dollar bank accounts using Goal Setter. And so it's going to take all of us doing that, and that's how you change the wealth in this country. And so for me, you know, I'm the kind of invest in early stage companies person through that lens. But I do, I mean, I have investments, I own real estate, um, you know, I've done that too, but I'm really focused on, you know, kind of investing in early stage companies. One thing I'll mention right now, crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding is now available for anyone. Usually you could only be a credit investor, you have to have a certain amount of wealth to be able to invest in early stage companies. Now with equity crowdfunding, they have these platforms that you can invest. I just want to say, you know, you know, Early stage investing is not for the faint of heart. You need to know how to do it. You need to, you know, do due diligence. But these platforms do allow you to do that. Um, if you had invested in two hundred dollars in Uber, Uber when it came out, when it first came out, um, you know, it, it, it's worth multi, you know, multi million dollars. You know, obviously for every Uber, there's companies that aren't going to be an Uber. Um, but you know, that's kind of what I'm focused on. But all those other things are great too. You know, looking at real estate and obviously investing in stocks. And would you say also to um, Lorraine, right, as an attorney, that it's because you mentioned that Biggie didn't have um, a will. Well, he died right? without a will. Yeah. Say, same thing with Prince. Am yeah. I correct? Right. So it, the worst. There's literally this. So I live in Newark, New Jersey, Brick City. Yeah, but I grew up in Westfield. So when you said Plainfield, I said, okay, I know I'm not Plainfield. Right. That's where all the black people from Westfield used to say they were from, so they could have a little street cred. <laughs> so, but. I say all that to say there's this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful home in Newark called the Kruger Mansion. And there's an older woman who lives here who's like, oh yeah, I grew up there. Her, her parents or her grandmother was one of the wealthiest um, black women um, in the country. I forget due to what means. And if you look like this woman is still alive, she maybe is like, I don't know, maybe 70 something. She grew up in this beautiful mansion and you look at it, it's dilapidated. And you ask yourself why, because that wealth was not passed down. It's not enough for myself, Terry, Lorene to grow wealth. It doesn't matter if we don't pass it down in a way that it's preserved through wills, through trust, through estate planning, you know, and through education, because I can put together all the states and everything, but if I don't explain to Alyssa what she needs to do and how she needs to navigate, it's going to be lost after her anyway. So that part is really important to estate planning is a critical piece to passing down that wealth and maintaining it in our communities. Yeah, that's the wealth preservation. I mean, so all of those things you need to look at preserving your wealth through estate planning, you know, life insurance, um, you know, because if you, if you have a certain amount of estate, um, it's going to get taxed. You know, I think it's like the gift taxes. If you have $11 million, um, you know, it's a massive tax event. And so there's ways you can buy things, insurance to kind of cover that, um, and, and people, wealthy people do this all the time. And so they preserve their wealth, you know, when they get to a certain amount of money, they're now in the stay rich business. And, you know, and we need to, as a community, we need to learn how to, how to do those things as well. 
Yeah. And can I actually just add a gem there? So one of the things I realized recently with my trading accounts is that I can actually change all my trading accounts to join accounts and add someone else. So I've added like my mom to my trading accounts. That way, if something happens to me and she has to get the money, it won't be a tax event for her because she's already in the account. She'll already have access. So you guys might want to think about that too. It was just the gem I learned recently that I want to pass on to you guys. Like if there is someone that you think you may have to pass money to after you after you go, maybe add them to the account now. That's just a nugget. And then one other thought I have on this about like how to spread wealth. I'm totally with you, Lorreen. If we can get more people to know how to do what we do, then we'll be able to start changing generational wealth. And so like recently we had this million dollar a day campaign where we were helping a thousand people learn how to make a thousand dollars in a day. But the thought was, if I can teach a thousand people how to make a thousand dollars in a day, they're now generating in the community a million dollars a day. And now they can take that money and do different things in the communities. And this is most of my people in the course are like African-American, 80% are African-American. So this is like, we're generating a million dollars in black and brown communities around the world, which is awesome. So I totally agree with you. When we can teach the knowledge, then more people can do it too. That's so fantastic. And so what are you utilizing to disseminate this information? Is it social media? What other media outlets would you ladies like to see support these kinds of initiatives? You guys, I'll go first and then pass it along. I know for me, like YouTube actually has become a really big platform. Like a ton of people are looking at YouTube and a lot of my students are now starting to see my videos on YouTube. I'm a, I'm a course creator. So my course is actually on Teachable. So online courses, as they continue to grow and we're you know still at home with COVID, I think that's really important to keep pushing forward the online course platforms. When your kid's at school virtually, you're at school too. You go get you an online course. <laughs> so those platforms are huge. And then I would love to see us more in the media. I think that many of the channels are doing great jobs, but I'm loving seeing more, more Black people on CNBC and more <laughs> people of color on all the channels. So uh, all of those I, I'm for. Tiffany? Um, yeah, so I, I have an online school as well. It's, it's more foundational. I always say it's the... It's the prerequisite to the rest of your financial life, right? So it's foundational financial education when you're just starting out. It's called the Literature Academy. Um, but then I, I mean, I'm a teacher. So for me, I'm always looking for platforms. Like I, I have the new book that you guys are going to hopefully win, Get Good With Money. Um, but I, I know that's why I asked my stepdaughter about TikTok. I only want to do TikTok, but y'all are on there and you want to learn some finance, you know, <laughs> So, but what I, I, to Terry's point that yes, I would love to see uh, more of us on um, TV. I mean, I've been, it's been picking up. I'm like, is my name out there? Cause you know, this is so funny. I did a, um, I did a, I don't know if you guys know like Ryan Serhan to like sell it like Serhan. He's like on Bravo TV. Anyway, I did a panel with him last night and the woman was reading my bio like, oh, a law passed. But I was just on the cover of Money Magazine for where well, I am for this month, all this stuff. And it was a white woman and she was like, Oh my goodness, how come I'm never hearing about you? If, if, that's like, and y'all will understand this, black and brown folks. That's like, if someone says, um, who's Cedric the Entertainer? We know because in our community, he's hilarious, he's funny, you know, hang with Mr. Harvey, we know. And so I feel like I have done all of these things, but mainstream media, the truth is the spotlight is not on us. Why is Terry not like on every like platform, why? You know, like how many black and brown sisters have an online school that, that's making, you know, um, $10 million a year more? According to her, Teachable, just her, you know? And so it's just, it can be a little frustrating because people are just like, when I, when I meet people outside of our community, like our community knows what we're doing. When I meet people outside of it, they're like, oh my gosh. So wait, budget Nista? I'm like, sis, I've been in this game for years. It's made me an animal this morning. <laughs> Literally 10 years strong. And so, but what, I, what I've learned is that I've created our own platform. So like, I have learned that like, not to wait for someone to, to create a space at the table, I built a house, right? So there are over in my, in my audience are over a million uh, black women strong, 
We have a Facebook group. There's half a million black women on that Facebook group. My email list is half a million, but I'm my own network. And so they can either catch up or not, you know? And so like I created, like I wrote my first children's book, right? And so people usually, like, I don't know if you know, but books, I'm looking for it. Books usually don't sell more than, um, I don't even know, especially children's books, like more than like 2000 copies of a book in a lifetime. Most books don't sell. What? We sold that in the first, I think, seven days. It sold. It, it just came out last year. It sold well over ten thousand copies. It teaches. You see how chocolate she is? Because I was like, our faces are going to be everywhere, right? I'm like, look at her four C hair. I was like, no, I love the Tia and Tamara loose curl. That's cute. That's not my hair. So I just think that even if if if, if those places don't make space for us, we can make space for ourselves. I wrote this book. I, I'm not, I'm not I, a, a big um, production company or not a production company, but publisher asked to purchase it. I said, no, because I have plenty of money, but I, I want a creative control. I'm making her YouTube channel now because I hired an animator so we can have shows to show a healthy family navigating personal finance in a way that's age appropriate. And I have a production company that's like, we want to partner with you to do so because to force these stories to be told with our voice. So I just, I, we, black and brown people already dominate all the social media platforms, Clubhouse, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It's us that powers that, you know, you can also create your own platforms or, you know, um, cause there are people like Kev on stage. If you haven't heard of him, he's an amazing comedian. He's created a platform for his black and brown um, um, comedian um, friends. There are people who've created platforms. So lean into those as well. We're making other people wealthy with our creative energy and juice. But I'm like, no, I don't even want to see the table. I'll, I'm, I'll build my own house. And I encourage you to do the same. It's fantastic. Lauren, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, well, I'm going to catch up with these ladies because I'm going to create an online course. I've been working on that. So because I really think, um, you know, I people reach out to me constantly because there's very few black women who are venture capitalists. And, um, you know, obviously I can't invest in all those companies. And sometimes, you know, they're not at the point where I, I can invest in them anyway. But I do think, you know, as Tiffany is saying, building your own house. And again, you know, I want to try to be a resource and scale myself for entrepreneurs who are out there who need to learn about, you know, how do you go about, you know, setting up an equity crowdfunding or where do you go to get money? There's grants. There's all kinds of things that you need to finance your business. And so I could provide that knowledge. Um, and I totally agree with Tiffany in terms of, you know, um, building a house. So black and brown people. You know, and that's why the investment thesis is I'm investing in these type of entrepreneurs. By 2046, we're going to be the majority in this country. So I call it the new majority. We're not the minority. Um, and we do control culture in this country, actually globally, I would say. And anything that people, you know, Twitter, Black Twitter took it over, Clubhouse, you know, it was kind of like dull when it was just venture capitalists on it. And then Black people came on it and just like turned it up. And I mean, we do that constantly, but yet we use other people's platforms. So I'm looking for amazing companies that are out there that are creating, you know, tech platforms and, you know, that I can invest in and then use my not finan only financial capital, my social capital, my network to help these companies succeed. And that's what we need to be doing. And also for all of you on there, when we have these companies that are diverse owned, you know, find out about them, support them because we, you know, the dollar in our community turns over. As soon as we get a dollar, it's out the, our community. Whereas if you look at that other communities is turned over four and five times before it leaves our community. And we need to start doing that. And that's how we'll narrow the wealth disparity in this country. Oh my goodness, I could sit here and talk to you all day. We have about 10 minutes. Um, I just wanted to um, read one last question because I think it's really important um, because not everybody has access to a lawyer, right? Uh, so if there aren't any lawyers and you don't have one available, are there other places that you can create will wills for yourselves? Like for, you know, for for ourselves. That's what the question is. I mean, I can jump on as a, the lawyer. Um, yeah, I mean, there's resources. I mean, it's always better to have an attorney. Uh, but again, you know, what I would say is with the internet, you can research things, um, educate yourself. There are, you know, forums that you can download. I mean, it's always better to have a lawyer who can tailor that, you know, will or whatever, even if it's a, a any kind of legal document to your specific 
um, you know, needs, but, you know, at a minimum, yeah, you can, you can, you know, try to go online and do that. Um, and there are some kind of cost effective people that are out there that, you know, can create wills, um, you know, services that do that. Again, you know, it's always better to have, you know, your own attorney, but I understand that's not always affordable for people. Um, so I would say go about that, but I mean, read as much as you can on the topic. Thank you. And so maybe we can spend these last minutes talking about the mind shift. Remember we were talking about that? There's been this mindset that we can't take risks and we can't do this. So how can we change that mindset when it comes to us being wealthy and actually being an achievable goal? Tiffany, would you like to round up your thoughts with that? And then we'll have other ladies follow. Um, yes. So Honestly, it's, I'm not going to pretend like it's easy. I mean, I, I don't know that I would have started my own business had the recession not come and it taught me that because there's really no safer job than being a teacher, you know, like you need teachers, you need police officers, you need firemen. And so when I lost my job, suddenly it reminded me that there was no real safety, that the only thing that I really could bet on was me. And so that shifted that safety was actually what I used to think was risky going out there and just trying for myself. And so I think, I think one of the best things that you can do is to practice what you're good at. I like, I, I did a lot of, you know, Terry practice, um, you know, um, before she started, she jumped into the market. And for me, I, I'm really good at teaching. And so I, when I started the budget Nista for the first year, I helped all my family and friends for free and their friends to friends and their friends to friends just to see, because especially I find, especially women, you know, we, we're, we want to dip that little baby toe in. So I got my confidence together through practice. Um, and then I made the decision that I was going to see how far this thing can take me. And um, it has just, I, I mean, I was just telling like the, the panel, like earlier before we got on that, like I, what I've been, what's been able to happen, I don't, I, I don't have the words for, but there's so much more out there for you, if you are willing to rise above what, what looks to be normal for everyone else. I mean, I used to be a preschool teacher just ten years ago, making thirty nine thousand dollars a year. Now, if I made that in a month, I would be like, what's going on? The company is going down, you know. Um, this year we're on track to make $20 million, $20 million. We get to, I get to hire women that look like me, that you holding yourself back. It's not just you, what you're able to bring to this world, to your community, to yourself, really is just, there's so much good. There's so much change. There's so much transformation that's, that's, that's waiting on you to live fully into your existence. I, I was talking, I have a, um, my therapist, I was sharing with her that sometimes I'm afraid to say the things that I want. Like I want my book, Get Good With Money to be a New York Times bestseller. And I was like, yeah, but I don't know if like, you know, I want to exercise humility. And she reminded me, and I'll share this with you in close. She reminded me that humility is not shrinking. Humility is taking up just enough space. Humility is, is, is fully realizing what's been set aside for you. She was like, think about the sun. It is meant to shine as brightly as it does because if it shined too much, we'd burn up. If it shined too little, we'd all freeze. The sun does just enough. It has filled up the space that's been set before it. And me shrinking and you shrinking does not serve anyone. The sun was meant to shine and as are you. I love that. Thank you, Terry. Man, I love hearing Tiffany talk. Tiffany, you're my mentor in my head, so you oh, know. We gotta connect, Terry. I know, I know we haven't really connected. I was thinking about why haven't me and Terry gotten on the phone, but after this girl. Yes. I was like, I was just listening. I forgot the question now. I'm like, oh, this is great. I know. Um, Tiffany, yes, I it's those were such inspiring words. So what what we were talking about is the mind shift, right? Because I think I think it's safe to say that fear has always been a part of our nature, right? It's a part of the generational trauma. It's like no risk, no reward. We have been taught to survive, but no, let's shift our thinking. Now we've survived. We can survive. We already know that. We are undefeatable people. How do we thrive? Yeah. You know, what's crazy is my mom came from a generation. I had to realize this because she was always so afraid. And so I kind of stopped wanting to tell her things because I knew whatever she would tell me back would be negative. 
Um, and so she had to apologize to me one time because she was like, you know what, we just grew up in a generation where everything needed to be stable. We wanted the stable job. We wanted to, you know, everybody wanted to work for the state and the government because those jobs wouldn't go away. And so everything that that I'm doing in my generation, like stepping out on faith to go travel around the world and trade, who does that? Like, oh, you're just gonna quit your job, that good paying job? Like who, who every, people aspire to be assistant principal and you're gonna just leave being assistant principal? Um, but now she looks at where I am and it's like, this is a God thing. And so I would just say for the inspiring pieces, I had to find people that were ahead of me and then that helped to inspire me to go forward. So I hope that you guys seeing us on this panel, we're inspiring you. So for example, when I was um, earlier last year, I was talking to the founder of Teachable Ankar and he said only one course creator had hit eight figures. But when he said that somebody had hit eight figures, to me that was like, oh, we doing eight figures now? Bet let's go. And then I had two friends, black women, both of them had hit a million dollars in a month. And I was like, oh, that's possible. We're doing a million dollars in a month. That's what we're doing now. Let's go. Now I'm like, okay, every month needs to be a million dollars in a month. So I hope that by just us talking about this and making it more normal conversation that you guys are just inspired by the fact that, yes, there are three beautiful black women, four beautiful black women on this stage and we are killing it in our game. And we are making multiple millions. We are able to fund other companies. Like Lorene just said, they were raising four million. I just gave some money, you know, help them out. Like this is possible, right? So hopefully just seeing us is inspiring you all to, to know that you can do more. Harry, I, I receive it. I'm not there yet, but I receive it. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Lorraine. Amen. <laughs> Lorraine, um, tell us what, how, how do we shift this mindset? I mean, I think it's, you know, what Terry said, I think we've had generations, I mean, being black and brown in this country is traumatic, you know, and, but we got to let that somehow find a way to get over that. And like, to let not let fear lead us and I mean I've been you know I've been fearful you know I went to the right schools you know did what I was you know got good jobs like I got paid well and to say walk away from that to like pursue your passion is like you know most people don't do that and so and it's a risk involved but we have to be able to embrace risk you know calculate a risk and, and go for it. And, but it's a hard thing, but I hope, you know, I mean, I'm inspired by both Tiffany and Terry. And it's so ironic because I've been working on this online course and to see that these women are, you know, kicking butt, it just inspires me to know that, you know, I could maybe create something like that. Um, and I know I have knowledge that I can impart to people. Um, and so they've inspired me. And, um, you know, I guess just like lean in, it's like, don't be afraid. I know it's so, it's easier said than done, but just try to get over your fear and conquer those fears. And I guess, you know, every day work towards a goal, you know, you know, so, you know, today you do something and then that today becomes this week, you're, you're, you're doing something and that week becomes a month and that month becomes a year and just be consistent. None of, none of us, none of this happened overnight. Like I've been at this, I started investing eight years ago, investing my own money and then I was able to create a multi-million dollar fund. You know, I didn't wake up and suddenly have this fund. I mean, I had to take all these steps to get to this point. I'm sure Tiffany as well as Terry has had to do that. And so, you know, but just keep, I've been working at it every day, doing stuff where it's like, I didn't get paid to go speak on something, but I was like, okay, Okay. I want to impart my knowledge and I met a contact through that and this door open and, you know, you just got to, you got to keep doing it and be consistent. So I just would say that that's the way just being consistent and, and don't think that this is going to happen overnight, plant those seeds. They'll sow eventually, but keep watering and keep planting. Absolutely. And again, it's such an honor to share this space with you and the fact that we were given the opportunity to have the space to talk about this. I got to give a shout out again to Sharifa, Munis of New Way Foundation and Laura Plato from Volunteer Match. Ladies, if you could come back again on screen, your presence is needed because this is a, truly a celebration and a truly a test. It's truly a testament to the power of women and what women can do to lift each other up. You all are example examples of this, and I couldn't be. Uh, am I only getting emotional? <laughs> Thank you. Um, because I have a kid and I'm a single mom and. Um, I see what's possible and 
today, fear is out the door. And I hope that all of our audience members feel the same. Our mind shift needs to change. Our, our mindset needs to change. And so I just want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. And I hand it over again to the hosts of this amazing event. Thank you everyone for joining us. I just want to say something, one, one last thing. And so I would say, instead of us coming back- I'll raise you. We should actually get together and pitch this as a show. Girl, you hold on, hold on. <laughs> Yes, I'm right. down for that. Let's yeah, will go. people watch? Will you watch that if it gets picked up? Will we create? If they don't pick it up, we create our own show on YouTube right. or something. Well, right? Is, Who knows? right. Well, listen, <laughs> we are all connected, regardless. Yeah. This, this, that moving forward, you cannot get rid of me. I'm just gonna let you all know. You will Same not here. be able to get rid of me. No worries. Reach but, out. Um, I'd love to keep in touch with all of you guys. Are absolutely. amazing. Absolutely, absolutely, Sharif, uh, Laura. If you have any parting words, I just want to personally again. Tiffany, Terry, Lorraine, this has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your voices, your expertise, your queenness, your energy. You all are incredible. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. You were an amazing host. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you for having us. And thank you guys for all the wonderful comments in the chat. Yeah. I was watching the chat and you guys were on fire. Thank yeah. you so much. Right? <laughs> so good. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, I... I you know, I know, um, you know, just for myself, and I know Laura will echo the same. Uh, we are truly honored that you guys took out of your busy schedule to be a part of this today. Everything that was said here today was needed. You inspired all of us. I sure am inspired. And Zynga, your energy moderating this event, let me tell you, you killed it. Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ladies. And you know what, uh, Laureen, Z um, Zynga, we're gonna be holding you to it, okay? Putting something together, you know, we definitely need to uh, have, um, have more of this out there for the world to see and to hear. So um, Laura, any, any, any last words? I just want to echo an honor and say thank you so much. We've been just getting amazing questions in the chat, fielding those for you all. We've got a lot of follow-up to come through. So everybody who's here has been asking about, you know, can you watch a recording, all that good stuff. So watch for follow-up from our teams in the in the early part of next week. We're going to do the best we can to get some Q&A out to you that for the ones that we didn't get to. And just a huge thank you to Tiffany and Terry and Zinga and Laureen and Sherry, everybody who's here today. Just absolutely amazing. I can't watch, I can't wait to watch the recording because I didn't get to hear everything because I was doing the chat. So thank you all so much. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, everyone.